When we think of the metaphor of a pebble being thrown into a body of water, we think of the ripple effect and the potential for that to make change. I've been a police officer for over 30 years. The pebble in my career was that question that I asked of a group of women 11 years ago in Washington Correction Center for Women in Gig Harbor, Washington. The question was if. If there was something somebody could have said or done to change the path that led you here, what would it have been? The women started answering the question. The answers became ripples. The ripples became waves. The IF project became its own nonprofit, and from those answers developed gender responsive and trauma-informed programming, not just inside the prison, but outside the prison, in juvenile detention facilities, and recently just opened a women's reentry transition center. One question, one ripple, one wave, thousands of effects. Thousands of people have benefited from the answers that those women courageously answered and we turned into programs. Those stories traveled all over the world. They've opened minds, they've changed hearts, they've created alliances in unlikely places, and they've built community. Stories, we all have them. They are powerful vehicles for change and education. And we believe in the story of mass incarceration, there is a powerful overlooked ripple that could change the entire wave of our broken criminal justice system. That is women, understanding women in the system. So let's take a look at women in the system. Penal Reform International reports 714,000 women and girls are incarcerated in the world. 714,000, 6.9% of the incarceration population. So you might be saying, that's not a big segment. But what they're also reporting is those numbers are going up at a higher rate than men every year, everywhere. This is a global issue. In the United States alone, we're up 850% since the late 1980s. The significant impact to community with the, that information gives us reason to look a little bit deeper into the criminogenic and societal reasons that lead women to incarceration. We know women's offenses are often related to poverty. Women also choose, at times, to engage in criminal activity as a means of survival for their family, for their children, and for themselves. Dr. Emily Salisbury at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and her colleagues have coined the term the female four to identify the overwhelmingly leading reasons for female incarceration. The female four in no particular order. Unhealthy relationships. Sad part of that is what we're also finding from research is when they get out of prison, they're returning right back to those relationships that are unhealthy and abusive because they have nowhere to go. Chemical dependency. Do I really need to say more about that one? Socioeconomic marginality. Women get paid less, we get paid less. That means that they can't afford to pay their fines or bail themselves out, which means they're actually staying in the system or prison longer. Anxious, depressive symptom. The World Health Organization reports that 80% of women that are incarcerated have a diagnosable mental health illness. So the female four, unhealthy relationship, chemical dependency, socioeconomic marginality, anxious, depressive symptom, those four. Not one is the same for men. Not one. Women are different. Dr. Salisbury also says women are not the vectors of violence we need to be afraid of. They are the victims of violence we need to be in care of. In care of. 90% of them report being a victim of a traumatic, violent crime in their lives. The impact of understanding these factors can be immediate and long-ranging. Currently, there's work being done on a Pathways of Hope model in a prison, and the research is showing these women that are engaging in this program are actually choosing to stay in prison longer. Come on now, who wants to stay in prison longer? They're staying in prison longer because the programming is working. It's programming that is gender responsive, and it's looking at the pathway that led to the behavior that led to the incarceration. And as a result of doing so, they can create personal individualized re-entry plans with a holistic look at where they came from, what happened and what's going on, and what they're returning home to. Home. 95% of people that are incarcerated are coming home. They're coming home to their children, their family, our neighborhoods, to community. I like to think of these communities as ecosystems. So what are we doing in our work to provide successful, beneficial re-entry that aids in a thriving ecosystem. What are we doing? First of all, 
We have got to educate ourselves and continue educating ourselves. Understanding the pathways that lead women to the system versus the men are dramatically different. And those of us in this work, also in realizing that, understand the power and control we have to assist in positive effect for these women, not just in their incarceration, but also in their reentry. And critically important, the collateral consequences to an ecosystem when you remove a woman or a mother, as well as when you return her. When we're taking a look at best practices, it's critical that we have gender responsive and trauma-informed care through this entire phase. Not just her journey, but actually our journey as well. So let's go back and look at this woman as a pebble. The obvious, she gets arrested, there's a ripple. The trial, a ripple. The incarceration, a ripple. That's all the stuff we see on the surface. But what's going on underneath that surface? What's happening in that ecosystem? The biggest thing that I'm most concerned of is their children. 85% of women that are incarcerated are mothers. Think about that. 85% of women that are incarcerated are mothers. That means the next potential population of incarceration or generations, I would add a plural to that, is their children. Their children. But if we can provide them with a good pathway home and understanding of what they need, give them the resources to come home and be there, they have the opportunity to be beneficial to their family, to their children, to our neighborhoods, and become a part of a thriving ecosystem. But this is bigger. 85% of them are mothers. We have the opportunity to work with them and break generational legacies of incarceration. That is huge. So in preparation for today's talk, I had the pleasure and opportunity to sit down with a group of women that we've been working with for over a decade. They're all on different pathways to their reentry, and asked them, what was most important for me to share from them to you? And they said this, when a woman gets out of prison, it's a much different transition than it is for a man. Because women, by nature, are nurturers for their families. And they're returning to families that they've quite often been isolated from during their incarceration. Secondly, family. If you haven't been to a men's prison versus a women's prison, the family dynamic in a women's prison is enormous. We as women are emotional, we bond, we, we're close. So when they're getting ready to get out, they're told, oh, by the way, with these rules and regulations, you can't talk to anybody in here anymore. And when you get out of prison, you can't hang out with anybody that's been in prison anymore. It's a violation. So there comes a tremendous amount of loss with their freedom. Devastating isolation. Devastating isolation is a word that we hear over and over and over, especially in the first three months of their exit. So let's think about that. How do you become gender responsive? Well, first of all, you gotta look at the research. It's not been around a long time, but you have pioneers. You have Bloom, Owen, Covington, Salisbury, Van Deaton, Van Hoors, Brown, Blanchett, Modley, hopefully I didn't leave anybody out. But though, and guess what, they're all women. The research is critically important to look at. Look at the programming. There's programming out there. Most importantly, sit down and listen to the women that have been there. You will find no better expert in the field, and two things will happen. Their healing journey will start, and your education journey and my education journey will start or continue. Now, I would be remiss if I left this out of the, the, the pink elephant in the room. I like to call it the female affliction of low self-esteem. Women, we all have it. Recently, I was just in, a, in all the California prisons, uh, all the California women's prisons, and when we started having this conversation, almost every head in the room nodded, including the female officers, officers in the room. It's a real thing. But by bringing women to the table and having their story matter and their input be heard and having them be a part of creating something, it not only helps in their path, it helps, and they know that it's helping somebody else, it builds their self-esteem. And self-esteem is critical to any part of success. The gender responsive and trauma-informed work that we do, along with others in the field, absolutely conclusive. We cannot keep broad-brushing this work and treating women the same as men and expect anything will change. It simply will not change. And those of us in this work, it is our responsibility to provide the best possible options for the people that we work with. And the only option that I see that is critically, critically necessary for women is to be truly gender responsive. 
Um, this work, I gotta be honest, the trauma is real. The secondary trauma is no joke. It's hard work. My hope is that what you will do if you get that lens switched and you become gender responsive or look at it differently is that you will learn something new that you didn't know. You will create connections that you didn't know that you had and it will re-inspire or inspire you to continue doing this critically hard work. Women are the gatekeepers to our future generations of incarceration. So today, I brought some pebbles. I encourage you to take one with you, look at it. Not one of these is the same. The genders are not the same in the work that we do. The people are not the same in the work that we do. Put it in your pocket, carry it around for a while, and ask yourself, what are you doing in your work or in your life to help foster a healthy pebble or a healthy person? What are you doing? That's how we make the change. Women and girls, they are not the vectors of violence we need to be afraid of. They are the victims of violence we need to be in care of. And in understanding this, we can start to heal. Heal this broken system. Thank you.